This is the BBC Home and Forces programme. This is Bruce Belfridge. Here's some excellent news which has come during the past hour in the form of a communique from GHQ Cardo. It says, the Axis forces in the Western Desert are now in full retreat. Radio was the voice of Britain before, during and for some time after the war. But as the 50s wore on, the nine o'clock news on the wireless became less of a national institution. Another medium began to take over from radio as the main source of broadcast news. Television broke through with the outside broadcast coverage of the 1953 coronation. Although there were only two million sets in the country, a major operation was mounted to cover it. It was a huge success, watched by 20 million people in the United Kingdom, although the cameras didn't show the crowning moment of the ceremony. It was hoped at the time that the guns and bells would inaugurate a new Elizabethan age. In fact, they marked the beginning of the television age. Forests of aerials grew in suburban streets. The idiot boxes, as they were sometimes called, multiplied, mainly as a luxury in middle-class homes. In the early 1950s, news on television consisted of a newsreel and sound-only bulletins, identical to those on radio. The BBC had been making its own newsreels since 1948. These became very popular, and by 1954, they were on the screen five nights a week. In the year after the coronation, the number of sets in Britain went up by 50%. As the audiences for programmes grew and techniques became more sophisticated, the need for a real television news bulletin began to be felt. So with some trepidation, the BBC News Division took the plunge. That plunge is well remembered by Pat Smithers, the first editor of BBC Television News, now in retirement. He was a former Fleet Street and radio journalist and he was given the formidable task of getting the television news service on the air. Time and facilities were short, as he explains. The BBC really was not ready for the operation. Uh, we were all sort of shanghaied into it at a very late hour. Um, roughly at Easter in 1954, with a deadline of July 5 to be on the air, and uh, there was simply nothing ready for us. So you had this problem of lack of time. Uh, your technical resources, I gather, were very limited too. There were none. Um, when I arrived at Alexandra Palace on Good Friday morning uh, of 1954, I was horrified to discover that when television service had moved out from its birthplace to commodious new premises at Lime Grove, it had taken with it, not unnaturally, every conceivable piece of uh, electronic gear. Um, we had holes in the floor at Alexandra Palace and very little else. I'm not being absolutely true there, there were two studio cameras, uh, but they were 1936 emetrons. And uh, uh, first of all, they gave the cameraman, the operator, an upside down picture of whatever he was pointing at. Secondly, uh, if the nose of the subject happened to be in focus, uh, his ears were certainly out. The independence of Laos, Cambodia and southern Vietnam have been guaranteed by the treaty. The treaty is to run for an indefinite time and it's open for others to join. The conference itself was over in three days. One of the delegates remarked at the end that it was proof of the general goodwill prevailing that he'd never known a conference which achieved its purpose so quickly. Not an early television news bulletin, but an audition. Alan Skempton was one of those on trial, but neither he nor anyone else got the job of reading the news on television, for the time being. The fear in news division was that if someone were allowed to present the news in vision, he would stamp his own personality on it and somehow damage the BBC's reputation for objectivity. Good evening. 
Another auditionee was Frank Phillips. His objectivity was presumably beyond question, but even he was felt to be too much of a risk in the early days. There was great fear at the time of the power of the television personality. At 10 o'clock this morning in Manila, Mr. Casey for Australia put the first signature to the Southeast Asia Defence Treaty. Despite these cautious hesitations, the birth of news and newsreel was proudly announced in the Radio Times by Tahu Hole. This formidable New Zealander was in charge of all BBC news broadcasting. Steeped in the radio traditions of Rethian impartiality, he ran television news with extreme caution. But Hole was very much aware of the potential of television news. He knew he was starting, as he put it, a service of the greatest significance in the progress of television in the United Kingdom. That significance was far from clear in the very first news and newsreel shown on July the 5th, 1954. Here is an illustrated summary of the news. It will be followed by the latest film of events and happenings at home and abroad. The truce talks in Indochina went on today. They had begun yesterday when the French Union and Viet Minh representatives agreed on the subjects to be discussed. It is in a neutral zone here at Trung Gia that the talks are being held. They concern the regrouping of forces after a possible ceasefire. This picture, received by radio, shows civilian refugees leaving one of the big towns in the southern Red River Delta when the French withdrew last week. Reports on high prices for meat at Smithfield today were quoted in Question Time in the Commons. News and newsreel was not well received. The newspapers, of course, had reason to fear television news, but Gerald Barry probably expressed a general view when he wrote in his television column in The Observer, The sad fact has to be recorded that news on television does not exist. What has been introduced nightly into the TV programme since last Monday is a perfunctory little bulletin of news flashes, composed of an announcer's voice, a caption and an indifferent still photograph. This may conceivably pass as news, but it certainly doesn't begin to be television. Other questions were about the tests on Comet aircraft. You see one here at London Airport. The use of agency stills was consistently criticised and within a month they were replaced by film where possible. At the time, royal stories had great prominence in all the news media. The first news and newsreel had an item about a minor royal visit. The still picture again proved a disaster. ...and on arrival was greeted by Lord Derby. As shown in this wire picture, and first she visited the Hawker Aircraft Factory nearby. Then she drove along Blackpool Promenade to Fleetwood. From there she went to Barrow-in-Furness, where she was shown over the naval shipyards. After the news came the newsreel. News film in those days often had to find a leisurely way through customs and sometimes it appeared several days after it was shot. These pictures have now arrived from the United States showing the floods at their height last week after the Rio Grande had overflowed its banks. News film was shot silent in the early 1950s A sound recording apparatus was still too heavy to be easily mobile. So adding suitable mood music was one of the news film editor's basic tasks. Robert Dougal was one of the radio announcers who commuted between Broadcasting House and Alexandra Palace to put the voice behind the television pictures. In the old news and newsreel studio, he explains the next step. Well, something had to be done. You couldn't just have a complete magic lantern technique. So then it was decided to put the top editors and correspondents, the journalists, the top journalists uh, in front of their cameras, you see. But excellent as these chaps were at their job, they were simply not practiced in reading scripts in front of a camera, in communicating news to other people, which is a special kind of skill. They had not got this, and of course they hadn't got a prompter. They were completely bound by the script on the desk. And uh, this meant that all the time their eyes were going up and down like this, you see, naturally. And so they were accused of looking furtive. And I remember one of the papers, one of the tabloids coming up with pictures of these luckless individuals who were chosen to present the first news in vision. And uh, 
There are about seven of them, I said, I think. And it said, uh, with pictures of them, these are the guilty men. <laughs> with jolly bad luck on them. In May 1955, there was a major news story, Churchill's resignation. Sir Anthony Eden has been appointed Prime Minister. The headlines were still read off screen, but then experienced journalists were permitted to present the stories. Here in the studio to report on the main news of the day is our parliamentary correspondent, E.R. Thompson. The following announcement was issued from Buckingham Palace soon after half past eleven this morning. The Queen received the Right Honourable Sir Anthony Eden, MP, in audience this morning and offered him the post of Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury. Sir Anthony Eden accepted Her Majesty's offer and kissed hands upon his appointment. Well, that's the end of the announcement from Buckingham Palace. And now it's worth remembering that these correspondents had none of the technical aids which make life easier for modern newsreaders. From his home in Carlton Gardens, just before 11 o'clock this morning, Sir Anthony came out in morning dress. Photographers and cameramen were there to catch the Foreign Secretary's famous smile. The differences between then and now aren't just a matter of technique. The underlying social attitudes were different in the mid-50s, and so were beliefs about the role of news broadcasting. The latter were soon to be radically changed. Sir Anthony came out to his first public appearance as Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury, as well as Foreign Secretary. And it's now the smile... In 1955, the BBC lost its monopoly and an independent television news service was promised for the autumn. You see, ITN had nothing like the problems that we were facing. They were starting from scratch. They were able to recruit their staff for television, whereas the BBC news was really an extension of the radio news. They were not the victims of their immense resources. They were able to plan and start from scratch. In the summer of 1955, a former barrister, then a BBC radio producer, was hired by ITN as one of their first newscasters. We did dummy news uh, casts. We, by that I mean we had uh, the cameras going out and filming stories, and then they were played on, a, on, a, on the white wall in lieu of a screen, and at news, news bulletin times, the whole of the 150 strong staff of ITN, secretaries, drivers, cameramen, everybody, engineers, came out and watched our dummy newscasts, which we did to a kind of wooden wooden frame, which, uh, which was in lieu of a camera. And uh, nothing I've ever done since has been so nerve-wracking as those, because the whole staff watched our performances, myself and Chataway, and the bits of film which went with it, and, and tried to see what possible resemblance this could have to a television news bulletin. Chris Chataway was just one in a long line of well-chosen ITN newscasters. Early on, there were upheavals involving Aidan Crawley, who'd started ITN. After disagreements over budgets, he left, and a Fleet Street man, Geoffrey Cox, replaced him. He faced formidable problems. Well, the main difficulty we had was to win the confidence of the public. Uh, ITN had already caught their attention, but that wasn't enough. Uh, we had to have their confidence as well. And to build up confidence in a news service takes time. You've got to work steadily to get a reputation for reliability, to prove that you can get on top of the news and that you're not biased. And my great worry in the early months was that if we made one or two serious mistakes, if we showed bias, um, or if we weren't there when the big news was happening, uh, that the audience might say, well, these are fine uh, when the news is light. Uh, they are fine uh, as an uh, interesting extra to the news. But for our regular news service, we are going to swing back to the tried and trusted BBC. And so my battle over the early months was to make sure that we not only gave an interesting service, but that we gave a news service. Uh, Aidan Crawley uh, launched the ship and uh, 
I suppose Geoffrey Cox navigated it through the, the stormy waters which followed as political pressures blew up and all sorts of gusts and squalls were created. And of course, a year after ITN was founded, people have forgotten this, we had the two biggest stories of the post-war era, Suez and Hungary. And if commercial television had not then had a good news service, although an infant news service, it wouldn't have held the audience at all because everybody was profoundly interested in those two stories. And that was when ITN really took off. Perhaps ITN's major contribution to television news was to pioneer the probing interview. In 1957, Robin Day went to Cairo for ITN at a time when, after Suez, Britain was still technically at war with Egypt. President Nasser agreed to be interviewed and Day questioned him vigorously, something quite new in those days. Instead of the interviewer saying to the person arriving at the airport, have your talks been successful, sir? Thank you. Have you had a good trip, sir? I hope you're not too tired, sir. And do you have anything else you'll be kind enough to say to us, sir? Uh, this all disappeared, and you asked straightforward questions which the public needed to know the answer to. Most important of all, President Nasser, may I ask you about your plan for running the Suez Canal, which you have deposited with the United Nations. Are you prepared to reconsider that plan, those proposals, to bring them more into line with the famous six principles which the Security Council said were essential for any settlement of the canal? Well, we feel that our last declaration is fulfilling the six principles. The main point of conflict was the insulation of politics of any one country. The position at the moment is that Egypt could go back on the declaration if it so chose. No, no, it is impossible. It is impossible uh, uh, after uh, the declaration and after what we said that it is an international obligation. Well, and why we go back? For what reason? To raise troubles? Well, do you expect the great maritime countries of the world to be satisfied with that answer without some international guarantee? Well, well, if they want... This interview proved to be the first example of a new form of international communication, telediplomacy. We were still legally in a state of war with Egypt. Uh, this was a very tricky uh, interview uh, because we uh, did it without any knowledge of the government and uh, we had to take that risk on our own shoulders. And had it gone wrong, uh, it could have been a, a very serious setback for us and could have done exactly the type of damage to our reputation that I was seeking to avoid. By now, there was a distinctive ITN style. It covered the news aggressively, sending star reporters and dramatic foreign assignments in a splash of publicity. It was brash, lively and flexible. It could afford to take risks early on because it had a tiny audience. Another element that we developed, uh, which generated itself, was humour. It was surprising how much humour we managed to uh, find in the news of the day and also uh, in the writing. We had good writers. Uh, we got a certain amount of wit uh, developing in the programme, which is in invaluable, of course. And uh, we then deliberately sought uh, lighter types of news. The uh, famous story of the chimps in the studio was one of these. That, if you like, was a somewhat more exaggerated version of the kind of uh, human story that we uh, sought day after day as an essential element in the bulletin. Meanwhile, at Alexandra Palace, BBC News was changing. Professional newsreaders were installed. Hugh Green, later to be Director General, took charge of news. A searching report on television news was prepared by, among others, two of television's young lions, Donald Baverstock and Michael Peacock. The contents of that report still make pungent reading. We were disturbed by the BBC-ish flavour of many of the bulletins. We noted the emphasis placed on the arrival and departure of Cabinet Ministers the inclusion of quotations from nondescript official or semi-official figures, the way in which platitudes and clichés uttered by an accepted public figure are so often presented to the viewers as significant statements. We were not happy about the performance of newsreaders, whose manner was often soft and tentative. The report was implemented, and in 1960, a new editor, Stuart Hood, tried to add televisual virtues to the sober bulletins. But how? by breaking away from the dominance of radio news because television news had basically been a radio news bulletin with pictures up to that time and it seemed to me when I came 
here up at Alexander Palace that what I had to do was to produce an illustrated newspaper, not a radio bulletin. <clears throat> and this meant that one had to judge whether one laid with a picture, for instance. This was something quite unheard of up to that time. And the other thing we had to do was to think about the style of the bulletin, which had been very highly formalized with rather formal language in the tradition of BBC radio news. And I wanted to get somewhat nearer to the ITN, more colloquial, looser way of speaking, and also, if possible, to break away from the BBC accent. For instance, we had uh, an Australian newscaster, which I did very deliberately, because I wanted to get away from the, the BBC voice. But I think that uh, the main thing I did was to encourage people to think in terms of pictures and not in terms of words, primarily, and also to say that the lead of the bulletin would be determined very often by the picture quality of the story, and it didn't have necessarily to follow the sequence that was going to be in radio bulletins. By Hood's time, news programmes on both channels were competing for mass audiences. Television had now become people's main source of news. Back in 1957, television was the main source for only 24% of a BBC audience research sample, while radio was for 46%. For 30%, newspapers were the main source. But by 1962, the situation had altered radically. Radio and television changed places. Newspapers had only a marginal rise. By 1971, things had altered very little. Television's share went up a little to 57%, while radios shrank further to 14%. Newspapers hardly changed their rating. So here, then, is the evidence for the TV news explosion. Was it competition which triggered it? I believe in competition. <laughs> I think it has two advantages in news. It makes for technical advantages that people compete against each other to get the news fast, uh, to present it clearly, and they also uh, learn technical tricks from each other and build on each other's expertise. I think it, uh, there is another reason for it in news which is even more important. It is the most uh, important guarantee of freedom, that if you have two or three news services to turn to, or at least two, uh, then the chances of uh, pressure being brought on news organisations, uh, direct or indirect, uh, is diminished. I think that what happened, if you look back historically, is this, that uh, ITN and BBC, if you like, started from two different poles, one being very formal, the other very relaxed. And we moved into, in my time, into a, a common area where certain conventions were accepted. And I think that was, was totally beneficial, actually. Television news stories like this may now reach an audience of perhaps 17 million people in Britain alone. Wars are fought out in full colour on drawing room screens. No one now doubts the effect of television news film on public opinion. Perhaps Tahu Hole was right to be cautious about the potential of a highly developed television news service. Looking back on 20 years of television news, Robin Day has some doubts. Well, 19 years ago in the mid-50s, uh, it was tremendously exciting to be uh, involved in television news, and one had a tremendous sense of the opportunities and the, and the new frontiers to be, to be conquered in, in using this new medium of information. But in recent years, I think, although that excitement is still there, one, is, one has become more conscious of the dangers and limitations of television um, because of its uh, dangerous concentration uh, on action rather than thought, on shock rather than explanation, and on personalities rather than ideas. Now, uh, I think television's supreme responsibility today, because it has such a tremendous power to project violence and irrationality, is to project at the same time rational discussion and intelligent consideration of all the problems we have. 